welcome to Canonical. I'm James Shaw, and I'm joined by Yad Darris and Sam Spieler. Hey. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Today, we are concluding our discussion of The Passport by Herta Mueller. This is the first book in our series, Life Under Communism. If you're joining us for the first time, we are also on Reddit. You can find that discussion in the episode description. We are also on social media at CanonicalPod. Next week, we will continue our series with a review of Satan Tango by Laszlo Kresnow or Kai. Perfect. We hope you'll join us for that episode as well. We are talking about this novel inside of our series on life under communism, but I think that actually the role of women in society is more central to this novel. I think it overtakes the tension between the individual and the state as the central theme of the novel. Do you see the relationship between these themes in the same way? I think it's a push-pull situation with those other tensions. I think the subjugation of the women in this book highlight the hypocrisies and brutalities that the men either, if they're not oblivious to them, they're at least unremorseful and apathetic. Yeah, I don't see it as overtaking, but I see it as two parallel tensions or conflicts in the book. Maybe it comes down to your perspective as a person, but for me, the reason why I say it overtakes it is because you have the subjugation of women without Ceausescu, but you don't have Ceausescu because women are subjugated. One is a kind of omnipresent fact, whereas the other one is just a particularity. And I think that the difference between the omnipresent subjugation and the particularity of their experience in Romania is what Mueller is playing with in the novel. If we have them both as themes, though, Sam, you said it's a push-pull. What do you mean by push and pull? That the issue of the subjugation of the female characters, yes, it, it is an ever-present thing that is not just because of Ceausescu, but I think it's not in a vacuum. I think they go hand in hand with what is happening with the women. And I think the issues that the women face, they would be facing anyway. But I think they are not even just brought to the forefront. I think they are, they are made worse by the fact that they live in this kind of hyper-brutal nation-state. If we see the novel as anti-communist or anti-socialist, I think that is a perspective that a lot of male readers can endorse and will be intrigued by. Do you think that Mueller perhaps alienates some of those male readers by deviating from this kind of social critique that they would be interested in by focusing on the lives of women as in perhaps adjacent concern? I don't think so, because I think she does it pretty deftly. I think she, like, I don't think you're wrong. I think that is maybe the main focus, but I don't think she does it in a way that is very overt. Like, I feel like if you don't want to see that, you could ignore that, even though it is very much there. Well, that's kind of the next question, then, I guess, is if I call this a feminist novel, would you agree? I think so. But I think you have to do that work for it. Um, like I said, I think you could read it without getting too much of the feminist point of view. It's definitely there, but you could gloss over those things and just wag it off as, well, that's just part of the communist problem. So to clarify, yeah, are you saying here that feminist novels will alienate male readers? Not all of them, of course. I think we're a bunch of red-blooded men, and we enjoy a good feminist novel as much as the next guy. But I think that just in terms of my understanding of American readership, an anti-communist novel 
is going to appeal to a group of people that a feminist novel might not. I think there are other things, as we discussed in the review portion, that are going to hold back readers much more than any feminist critique. Yeah, of course. I'm definitely not saying that feminists should hold back, you know, at the cost of uh, alienating some American readers who aren't down with feminism. I think that's not my point. It's just, just to understand what the politics of the novel are. I said earlier that I thought these two ideas worked in parallel. And what I mean by that is, if you look at it from the broadest sense, you're looking at people who are compelled to do things they do not want to do. And that is very broad, you know? Um, but I think that's also the crux of this book. It looks at how the individual is compelled to do things by either the state or by other individuals. Like for me, that is the point of the book. And you could read that as a critique of communism or other authoritarian regimes, but you can also read it as a feminist text because of how women are compelled to do things they don't want to do, mainly in this book by Windisch, but generally by men. So that's why I don't see one as being prioritized over the other, because I think there's ample evidence for both in the book. To get more into specifics of this novel, I think that the two characters that are worth looking at are Katharina, Windisch's wife, and Amelie, his daughter. They are similar, there are parallels, but there are also some differences. Do you think that they act as a kind of foil to each other? Yes, I think so. One of the things that stuck out to me was how Katharina doesn't have much to say at any point in the novel about the idea of her daughter being used as a sexual commodity in order to get their family out. I think that is probably to do with the fact that she had to do the same thing in order to survive, or at least a very similar thing in order to survive. But it struck me as still very cold that she should be so not just willing to let her daughter, but just to have no comment on it at all. This is something you hinted at last week. You'd said that Amelie's attitude towards this kind of sex exchange might be negative. Do you think it's different from Katharina's in some way? Well, I think the societies they were living in were different. I think it was a matter of life or death for Katharina. She either found someone to sleep with or she died because it meant the difference between having enough clothes or having enough food. Whereas with Amelie, she's being used by everyone around her. She's being used by her family so that they all can get a passage out of the country. I'm not saying that Amelie wants to stay in the country, but she has sexual capital that is being exploited being exploited by others around her rather than her own volition. We see in the novel a scene with Amelie and her boyfriend having sex. They go on a date and they have sex. Mm -hmm. Does that scene add something to your understanding of her attitude towards sex or how she might be different from her mother? in terms of the way that she views herself as a sexually valuable person. I think it goes along a little bit with the idea of Heimat that I mentioned last week, where I don't think that would be seen as a very traditional lifestyle. Doing it on a trash can? Yeah. I think she is more liberal in that way and more free but I don't think that should automatically transition to that she is willing and certainly not happy to sleep with the priest or the militiaman. What about Katharina refusing to sleep with her husband? And the first time we see her in the novel, she's masturbating. She is a sexual character, clearly, but her sexuality is presented in a different format. What does that mean? 
I did not see the two as being necessarily foils. I think you both said that you did. I can clarify, I guess. What I mean here is not that they recognize their relationship as being foils or adversaries, but rather they exist in the novel for the benefit of the reader to see the differences in their situation. I agree with that. I think the similarity I would draw is that they both understand they have sexual capital. And I think this is where I differ from Sam, is that I don't view it as exploitation necessarily, because I think in both instances, they are willing participants in using their sexual capital. Even though, in one instance, the mother, Katharina, is solely benefiting from it. Whereas in Amelie's situation, her parents also benefit from it. But that doesn't mean necessarily that she's being exploited in my mind. It just means that she is participating in something that benefits not just herself. The counterpoint to that, I'll say, though, is that there is that scene where it describes her sexual encounter with the two men and it splices the encounter with each other. And it's portrayed in a not pleasant way. So I'm not saying that she is enjoying it, but what I am saying is that I think she is willingly trading it insofar as a person can in this kind of state that exploits people. I think this kind of attitude that Amelie has is something that I think is worth focusing on because that also stands in contrast to Windish, her father, and the Night Watchman. Those two male characters, they have this ongoing fixation on women and their nature, but they're very naive. There is a lot of complication and subtext involved in women's role in this society, and they seem to be able to navigate some of it. Like, they understand that this sex for the baptismal certificate is necessary, even though nobody is actually saying to them directly, listen, this is what you do, this is what you get, they understand how the exchange works. And then there's some irony involved when her mother is dressing up Amelie for her quote-unquote date, and she says, you know, don't put on too much makeup, people will talk about you. So there is some subtext involved, but the men, despite understanding a lot about this world, seem to be missing something. What are they missing? Is there something that the women of this world understand that the men don't? Well, the men certainly seem to think that women are there to be used. And I think the women understand that as well, but seem to recognize that they're there to suffer, whereas I don't think the men see them as people that suffer. I see it specifically with Amelie as pragmatism and idealism where Amelie's attitude, as James had expressed it earlier, is pragmatic. She doesn't choose to do this, but she knows that it's what needs to be done. And I think it's similar in Katharina's case. It is an unpleasant experience, but I don't think that Mueller presents it in a way that belabors the unpleasantness of it. It's a very matter-of-fact presentation. And the difference that I see with Windish is that Windish is agonizing over doing this. He doesn't want people to think of his daughter, and more importantly, I would guess to him, to think of him as a person who would allow that to happen. He has in his mind an idea of how women work and how his family should work, and he can't bear the fact that the reality of the world is contrary to that. Yeah, that's how I understand it as well. And I actually think that there is a danger in viewing women as being victims from a certain point of view. And what I mean by that is I think part of Windish's problem is he places a lot of value on virginity, right? And that's almost as if he's saying, well, this is something that a woman needs to hold sacred. But that's the kind of old-fashioned thinking that I think Mueller is criticizing here. That actually disempowers women, if you think of virginity in that way. The way that the two women here actually think about their sexuality, it sounds perverse, but in a way it's actually empowering them as much as they can be in this situation where, once again, the state 
is um, trading favors for sex. Do you think Windish is more comfortable with the idea of using his daughter in this way once he thinks he knows that she is no longer a virgin? Because he spends a lot of the middle portion of the book watching the way she walks and trying to use the the superstition that uh, the Night Watchman tells him about. That if you're yeah. he turned outwards or something. Yeah, and if if her something about her calves too. Well, this is just the same idea of capital, right? You can't spend the same dollar twice. So once she's no longer a virgin, if he can get anything out of her sexuality, it's just a bonus. So I think that that is this kind of simple-minded, old-fashioned view that he has of female sexuality. Like, he has an understanding of the world. He's not totally stupid, but it's very, very simple. Like, the conversation he always has with the Night Watchman is basically, the best of the women in Germany is still worse than the worst one here. He has an idea of exchange. He's not naive, but it's a very, very simplified one. Something I think is interesting is that in the same way that Amelie stands for this new generation, but also a more complicated view of sex and sexual capital, I think part of that is this trap is that she has this implied autonomy from having a job where she gets to leave. I think it's in a different village, right? Yeah. She she leaves the village to go somewhere else. So it seems like she has this kind of independence. But I think that that is a deception. And I think we can look at Ceausescu's um, policies that made contraception and abortion illegal at that time as proof of that. But also that she has birth control pills that she takes, but she has to get them on the sly. And... Her parents don't even know what they are. Her mom asks her about it, and she says that I take them just in case. The way she answers, the way they talk about it, it sounds like they're not necessarily talking about the same thing. There's a little bit of a double entendre, I think. And apparently one of the words she uses, fala, is actually the same word for snare or trap. So she's taking it just in case, but it's kind of just in case of being entrapped. I guess this is pointing to a larger question that's perhaps not answered in this book, but I think we could all agree that the worldview of the women is superior or more nuanced than the worldview of the men. They understand more and more clearly. But this pragmatism that the women have towards sexual exchange, is that something that Mueller is advocating for? I don't think she's advocating for it, but I think she is critiquing the male view of sex and how Windish idealizes virginity or how he idealizes um, chastity, maybe. Yeah. Yes, virginity, but more than that, too. Just the idea that you have to not be promiscuous, that there's some inherent morality to being chased. I think that the vase in the novel is important in this respect because after Amelie sleeps with the priest and the militiamen, her mother says, you should ask your father to buy the vase. And it seems like at that point, he would be willing to buy the vase, but she refuses. And instead, she wants to use her own money to buy the vase which almost kind of indicates that she has this attitude that you might see with like women who get involved in stripping or sex work or, you know, whatever it is, where they see it as a kind of empowering thing to make money with their bodies. They're excited by it. And in one sense, I've seen feminists say that this is a very empowering women first sort of thing that women can do this. But in the other sense, it's still an exchange that they probably wouldn't choose to make if they had other options. But she's not being paid for sex, at least not with money, in this book. Are you saying that the lines are being drawn there, even though 
that's not what happened in this case? Or is it just the empowerment? I think it's the empowerment. It's not coupled in the act of sex, but it's the empowerment that comes through navigating a world where sexual capital protects women. Interesting. I didn't think about that. I was mostly looking at that scene as her rejecting her father, her rejecting her parents, that that went along with her being more independent, breaking from the older generation. I saw that as a rejection, not just because of the fact that they are kind of this outdated worldview, but also kind of indignance that they would force her to go through with this. I think that, at least in my reading, using the terminology of our times, this could be considered an intersectional novel because it's focusing on the dominance of the state and also the dominance of the patriarchy. But does being intersectional add something? Is it always a net positive? Does it maybe make it less persuasive rhetorically than it would be otherwise? I think it might make it, you know, hypothetically less persuasive rhetorically, but I also don't know if rhetoric is the aim of fiction, though it might be the aim of Mueller in this book because it is so pointedly anti authoritarian. But generally speaking, I don't know if that's a problem. Like, I don't know if writers necessarily write a book because they seek to convince the reader of a certain ideology. Here I keep thinking of uh, Viet Thanh Nguyen and The Sympathizer. He is a writer who I think specifically is focused on rhetoric. I don't think that Mueller is necessarily the same as him, but potentially they have similar goals, political goals. And when it comes to representing the totality of real-world oppression and the way that oppression intersects with other forms of oppression, this feminist reading is very powerful, and it's accurate, it's true to life. But rhetoric does not need to be true to life. Often, isolating a cause or isolating a concern is more rhetorically effective than showing the full breadth of it. So I'm just wondering what you think Mueller's main thrust is. What is her main concern, if she even has one? Yeah, that's very difficult to answer because it goes to the author's intent. And not only is it difficult to discern the author's intent generally, I think in this book specifically, it is difficult to discern Mueller's intent because of her style. I think for me, the best I would be able to say is that so much of the form seems to be concerned with what it's like to live under this kind of totalitarian regime. That seems to me to be the stronger aim because of the form. I have an easier time linking, you know, the sentence structure and the short chapters that we talked about in in the review episode to the experience of living under this government. I have a harder time linking that to the feminist argument. And since the style is such a big part of the book, it ends up, for me, being the defining feature. So that's why I would say that perhaps she is more concerned with the state. But the problem, once again, is I don't think that one precludes the other, like I said earlier in our discussion. Really, if you just look at it very generally, she's concerned with how people are compelled to do things they don't want to do. And that can be manifested in terms of individual and state, and it can also be manifested in terms of patriarchy. This might sound tangential, um, but I think there's something here. We didn't talk about the title. The original title was Man is a Great Pheasant in the World. And that is a old Romanian saying. Not to, you know, deviate too far. I actually asked a Romanian guy about that, uh -huh. and he said he'd never heard it before. <laughs> well, was he old? 
same as you, but uh, I don't know if it matters very much if it's authentically Romanian. Sure. Well, my question about that is, if we assume that, yes, it is this old Romanian saying, how does that square with this feminist viewpoint? Well, I think we should first define what the saying means, which is, as I understand it, it means that people are tied to their fates. I didn't understand it that way at all. I think it's more that a pheasant is a kind of uh, large but bumbling bird that can't really control itself. And the lot of human beings in this world is similar. We have ambitions that don't match our capabilities. Um, is this your definition or is this... This is the way I understand it. I mean, it's not, as far as I know, as I said, I asked a Romanian and he didn't know it. But that's the way I understand it just from reading other people talking about it. Because what I wrote here was based on a Romanian author explaining what the phrase means. And I mean, she could be wrong. I don't even know actually if she's truly Romanian because I didn't read much about who wrote this. But what, what did I write here? the difficulty of man's life and destiny. And specifically, I think how she explains it is a great pheasant is unable to fly away and it can be easily captured and eaten. So you are not fully in control. Mm -hmm. But I think you could also understand as being bumbling. She focused on the inability of the pheasant to fly. Yeah, that's kind of where I was thinking as well, is that it's not a graceful animal. It's not the type of animal that seems in control of itself. Yeah, that's kind of the feeling I got, how he had interpreted it. But I see what you're saying, James. I see where that extra step comes in. But while that is supposedly this, you know, established Romanian saying, it does draw attention to itself that the first word is man, that it's not people. I know that's not how sayings like this go, especially older patriarchal sayings, but I feel like that's a pointed decision. I have to say, though, it's much, much better than the passport. <laughs> yeah. The passport is a shit title. Hmm. I can imagine very few Americans would have picked it up as man is a great pheasant in the world, though. So I'm sure her publisher was happy. I actually don't agree. I think the passport might be better for me. Boring. <laughs> I think it provides focus to the novel in a novel that doesn't have much focus. Yeah, so it's kind of like a bait and switch, like... You've got this weird kind of arty novel, like don't sell it as a straightforward novel. I think you're right that it does give it focus. It gives foreigners like us something to latch on to, but I don't think that's necessary. I don't think that's needed. Well, tying it back to our discussion, I actually think The Passport is a much more feminist title. And I think Man is a Great Pheasant in the World is less feminist. Because the passport, like I said, it focuses us on the exchange. She is compelled to exchange her body for a passport. Whereas man is a great pheasant. It's kind of like, well, we can't control what happens to us. I mean, that could be anything. All right, we'll stop here. Thank you for listening. You can find us on Reddit and on social media at Canonical Pod. If you'd like to give us a nice review, please do on Apple or your podcast platform of choice. Next week, we'll be back with a review of our next book, Satan Tango by Laszlo Krasnow Horkai. Till then, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.